Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome everyone to the Timothy Johnson Medical Scholars Series. I think pretty much everybody in the room knows what that is, but at least for the sake of our guests and maybe a few others, I'll uh, recapitulate what I've said many times before. This is to honor Dr. Timothy Johnson, one of the founding faculty members of the Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. And uh, Dr. Johnson was very dedicated to the research mission being integrated in medical education. And when he uh, passed a couple years ago, we had the honor of having him here for one of the first ones and named this lecture series in his honor. So it's a, a great tribute to his memory. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Fabio Caminelli from uh, Case Western uh, University, Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Caminelli did his, uh, both his PhD and his medical degree at the University of Florence. Uh, he then did an uh, internal medicine uh, uh, fellowship in gastrointestinal uh, medicine, uh, also in Florence. And then he came to the States to uh, UCLA, where he did a GI fellowship at the medical center there, um, and then moved across town to USC, where he joined the faculty as a, a, initially assistant and associate professor of medicine, molecular biology, and immunology. Uh, and there he also served as the associate director of the Liver Center at USC. And then <clears throat> about 1995 or so, he moved uh, to the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, but not here, up the road, that other school, to the University of Virginia, where he became professor of internal medicine, microbiology, and immunology. And he directed their GI fellowship program, uh, was chief of gastroenterology and hepatology, and also directed the Digestive Health Research Center at UVA. And there had, a, I think, a lot of uh, uh, good relationships with some of the faculty that we have here today, including Dr. Yaten, who will be here any minute, I think, uh, at UVA. Uh, about 2008, he moved to Cleveland um, to become their professor of internal medicine and pathology at Case Western, where he directs a digestive health research center. And he's also the Herman Menges Jr. Chair in Internal Medicine uh, there, and serves as the chief of the division of GI and liver disease and has appointments, of course, at University Hospital and uh, the Medical Center there, and, and directs the Digestive Health Research Institute at Case Western as well. Um, Dr. Cominelli has received lots of recognition for his very substantial contributions, including an NIH Merit Award, uh, Outstanding Investigator Award from the American Federation for Medical Research. He's been selected as a top doctor, best doctor, and even super doctor with the uh, national evaluation. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't heard the super classification, but that sounds better than best or top to me, and I think that... They give you a t-shirt with it. <laughs> Superman right. logo. Uh, he's, he serves on a variety of editorial boards, translational research, uh, uh, Journal of Clinical and Translational Medicine, American Journal of Physiology, uh, Journal of Immunology, etc. So he's very busy uh, outside of the clinic and the lab, but uh, he is very well known for his research contributions in understanding inflammatory disorders of the bowel. Uh, he's made many, many contributions. I'll just allude to one or two briefly. Uh, he made some of the really seminal uh, discoveries about naturally occurring cytokine, including cytokine receptor antagonists and how an imbalance of the cytokine and the cytokine receptor antagonists can lead to inflammatory bowel disease. For example, uh, he has contributed uh, and made great use of an animal model, a mouse model, for an immunologically characterized spontaneous uh, uh, disorder of chronic intestinal inflammation. And as probably you all recognize, the human Crohn's condition, uh, for example, in animal models have been very difficult to, to uh, emulate and actually have something to really study that's similar. And of course, this presents in the animal model in the terminal ileum, uh, and it also involves uh, uh, presenting like Crohn's pathogenic thigh one T cells mediating uh, this disease and spontaneous mouse model. And from that model, uh, he's been able to come at this in a very fundamental molecular understanding of what's going on and come up with uh, clinical applications. So it's a beautiful example of translational research. He's also contributed in our understanding in the role of antibiotics and probiotics uh, and inflammation in the gut, and that, and that is having considerable interest and application uh, to human disease as well. So as you can see, it really covers the spectrum. Today we're going to hear about this exciting approach uh, in this cytokine receptor uh, analysis. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cominelli. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. One of the best introductions I ever had. Thank you. I want to thank the, the for for this invitation, and um, I think I had a wonderful time today. Really, uh, great meetings, and uh, I gave grand rounds at the hospital today. It was very very nice, and also my interaction with the students at lunch were very very nice. 
And today I want to I want to talk about the role of TL1A and DL3, which are relatively new cytokine receptor pair. This is a member of the tumor necrosis factor family, and the work we have done in understanding uh, their role in intestinal inflammation and inflammatory bowel disease. So uh, the disease I study is inflammatory bowel disease that, as you know, includes Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis. An important note is that we think that uh, the prevalence of this disease is now approximately 3 million people in, in only just in the United States, so making this really almost a public health model. Uh, this cartoon summarizes what we know about the pathogenesis of this condition. Uh, we know that there is a genetic susceptibility. This is one of the most successful stories of studying the genetics of a complex trait. You know, complex traits are di chronic diseases such as you know, IBD, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, uh, and others. And the, the successful story comes from the fact that the first gene clearly identified with Crohn's disease was NAR2 or CAD15. And many other genes have been associated. Uh, from, and now there are 200 genes that are associated with both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, making the situation very complex. I don't think personally that it's a disease where we will be able to have a genetic test to determine who is going to get the disease. I don't think we're going to have a gene therapy approach to cure the disease. But the, the most important value of the genetic study is the identification of pathways there are possible targets for therapy. For example, the discovery of NAR2 really has revolutionized our thinking, uh, uh, switching the focus on the innate immune system, whereas until then, the adaptive immune system was the focus of all the research, you know, lymphocytes, a specific antigen, what is the antigen. And this is true also for other diseases. And the object, you know that today, the focus of the innate immune system for many disease conditions is really very important. But in general, it's a polygenic disease, a very complex disease. The environment is extremely important. The increase in prevalence and incidence cannot be explained by genetic shifting or other genetic. There's something in the environment in the United States and many other countries where the incidence is rising that determine the disease. We don't know exactly what the environmental factor is. The gut microbiota is emerging, obviously. I, I, I sit on a study section. Uh, for the last five years, every single grant has a component of gut microbiota. It's the trendy uh, thing to study today. But there are many other factors, for example, the effect of smoking nicotine, which is very unique in inflammatory bowel disease. Smoking is bad for Crohn's disease. We tell our patient to quit smoking, but it's good for ulcer. The coli is actually one of the most important protective factors. We don't really understand at the physiological level why, but it's a very important environmental factor. Uh, at the end, I want to leave you with the message that in IBD, there is clearly an epithelial dysfunction. The epithelium in the gut is what interacts with the environmental factors. Uh, there is an epithelial dysfunction that we don't know 100%. There is a permeability defect. Now, the interaction between the genetic susceptibility and the environment leads to activation of the immune system, innate adaptive immune system, T cell activation, and the activation of the cytokine cascade. This has been the field of my research since now. 1987, and my modest contribution to the field has been the, really the characterization of the first study blocking a specific cytokine, interleukin-1, in an animal model of colitis, uh, leading to the idea that blocking a single cytokine could have been a successful uh, process. Now, this is a cartoon summarized, you know, the different cytokines involved in uh, immune activation, and we tend to divide the cytokines in different subgroups, you know, uh, cytokines that, that are uh, Th1 cytokines, Th2, Th17 now, so you know, more immunoregulatory cytokines. The one that I have focused my attention has been what I call innate cytokines. So cytokines that really have a very early effect in the immune cascade. And obviously among these, TNF, interleukin-6, IL-1 are really pivotal cytokines in this area. One important concept is that some of these cytokines, that, 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 although cytokines have a role in chronic inflammatory condition, they also have a physiological role that many, in many cases is a beneficial role. So when we develop drugs to block specific cytokines, we always need to take into consideration this part, so the homeostatic physiological role of these cytokines that are important in 
combating infections, viral infection, acute injury. IL-17 is a good example, was a great candidate for the treatment uh, of IBD. It works in psoriasis, blocking IL-17. In IBD, two studies have shown the blocking IL-17 is deleterious in patients with Crohn's disease. Actually, one study show increased mortality by blocking IL-17. Still, there's a debate of why. Uh, now, the cytokine that I want to discuss today is TL1A, a DL3 is the receptor. This is a, a also called TNF-RSF25. Uh, the, uh, homolo the ligand is TL1A, TNF-SF15. They are members of the TNF superfamily. Obviously, drug blocking TNF have been very successful, but in Crohn's disease, 70% of patients lose their, are not responding after one year initiation of treatment. So they still, the need to find other therapy, and obviously a member of the TNF superfamily is a very good candidate. DL3 is mainly expressed in lymphocytes, is upregulated upon T cell activation. TL1A is the only known ligand for DL3. It is expressed in endothelial cells and other immune cells. And one thing that attracted us to study the cytokine is that it's involved in TH1, TH2, TH17 regulation, act as a T cell costimatory factor inducing cell proliferation stimulates cytokine secretion. Also, TL1A has been shown to regulate T-REC function and innate lymphoid cell function. Therefore, it's very pleiotropic effect on the regulation of effect on a regulatory lymphocyte. And TL1A, DL3, has been already implicated in the pathogenesis of several auto-inflammatory diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and IBD. The pleiotropic effect are summarized in this slide where TL1A is produced by antigen-presenting cells, and you can see here the different uh, subset, more in a schematic representation. Basically, every single subset uh, is affected by TL1A, and now we can add to the list also TH9 cells and TH22 cells that are uh, regulated by interleukin-9 and interleukin-22. So it's a very broad pleiotropic effect on the regulation of lymphocyte. Now, we uh, have done already a fair amount of work in the, in the human disease. So this is, we took an approach that is a little bit different than other situations. So we first look in the human condition to find out the level of expression, the regulation, the localization of the cytokine. Uh, through a series of papers by us, and uh, primarily Steph Targan group at Cedar Sinai, uh, the, the results have shown that TL1A is the only gene associated with Crohn's disease in both Caucasian and Asian IBD patients. So there is a genetic association that doesn't mean that it's involved in the pathogenesis, but means that it has probably an important role as a pathway. We have shown that TL1A messenger RNA protein levels are increased in tissue from IBD patients. The expression is, is specific in terms of cellular localization of macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells in intestinal area of active IBD. A DL3 is expressed on IBD mucosa lymphocyte primarily. It's also expressed in epithelial cells. TL1A induced interferon gamma secretion by peripheral lamina proper nuclear cells. And the group from Targan has done some preliminary work showing that TL1A blockade with the monoclonal antibody is effective in ameliorating experimental colitis. Finally, he, through a model of TL1A overexpression, this investigator, we're, we're able to show that TL1A overexpression causes some colitis and some intestinal fibrosis. So strong evidence that TL1A can be implicated in the pathogenesis of chronic intestinal inflammation and, uh, and IBD. So this is our paper that was now published several years ago, where we showed that TL1A is overexpressed by Western blood in area of Crohn's involved compared to Crohn's uninvolved, immunohistochemical localization in areas of inflammation, both in Crohn's and in ulcerative colitis. You can see here from healthy tissue to IBD non-affected to IBD affected, there is increased immunolocalization and also increased expression of the receptor on CD4 and CDA lymphocyte. You can see here by this fax analysis. Also with this study in our mouse models, so specifically the SAMP mouse model that we'll discuss a little bit later, showing that TL1A is expressed on mucosa dendritic cells in mice during chronic ileitis, as shown here in this histogram. And also transmembrane DL3 the, the, the receptor is preferentially expressed on lymphocyte, as we expect from the human study. So now uh, I just want to jump to the aim of the study, which is 
in, in uh, the, the data that I want to discuss uh, with you today, which are unpublished data, we wanted to examine the role of Tier 1A, Tier 3 in regulating chronic inflammation using our models of Crohn disease like ileitis, two models specifically, using the approach of deleting the both tier DL3 in, in a series of studies and the ligand tier one a in our models. The first model that we use, it is model that, that uh, Michael was referring before, spontaneous mouse model of Crohn's ileitis called the SAMP mouse. These mice develop spontaneous chronic Crohn disease like ileitis uh, with increased apoptosis of ileal epithelial cells. There is increased ileal permeability by three weeks of age. And an interesting aspect is that the model is highly responsive to treatment that we use in patients with IBD, such as anti-tumor necrosis factor and steroids. And the second model is the TNF Delta Re mouse model, which is a model of overexpression of TNF by manipulation of the, uh, by a knock-in into the AUR region of the TNF uh, mouse gene, where these mice develop overexpression of TNF and develop a spontaneous chronic ileitis and also spontaneous arthritis. Two beautiful models. This is the first model, the SAMP mouse, that our medical students have uh, discussed in the, in the paper that they discussed yesterday, I believe. It's a, it's a model where uh, the resemblance to the human condition is uh, exceptional. There are cobblestone areas, so if a pathology opens up a specimen from a patient with Crohn's disease, that's exactly what you see. You see this area of involvement, alternating with areas that are normal, you can see here. This is a cobblestone area with significant disease, alternating of area where the villi are intact. And this is the stereomicrosis for a normal mouse. You can see that's how the normal appearance with no inflammation. Uh, endoscopically, you see, it, uh, we can even endoscope our mice and look at a disease affected mouse. You see with the, the difference between normal appearance of an endoscopy with the normal vasculature or normal control mouse. The control mouse for this thing is the AKR mouse which is the parental mouse. You can see here how there is ulceration, loss of the uh, architecture, ulceration inside the terminal ileum. Second model, TNF delta re mice. Uh, these mice depicted here uh, in the homozygotic status, they are small, they are visibly sick, they die prematurely. The heterozygote is also a little bit smaller, it becomes six later on, and this is the control, basically black six uh, wild type litter mate. As you can see here, histologically, by eight weeks of age, the homozygotic mice already have a very significant level of disease, analyzed here histologically by the total inflammatory index. At the, at the 24 weeks, you can see how the heterozygote also a significant disease, now represented here, the homozygote that don't live until 24 weeks. And uh, uh, this is histologically, you can see how there is uh, very significant inflammation with with uh, uh, infiltration of the lamina propria and other inflammatory component. So in terms of the SAMP mouse, the, I just want to spend a minute to tell you how this mouse was uh, developed. So this was developed by a very ingenious breeding program from Japanese investigator in the 1960s. They purchased some mice, they came mice from the Jackson lab, and they started a program of brother system made in for many, many years. They developed first this mouse called the senescent accelerated mouse. So the, the, right, the resulting mouse are the senescent accelerated mouse. And then they bred this mice for 24 additional generators and they developed several lines the, the, from SAMP1 to SAMP10. And the SAMP1 were further analyzed, uh, they were characterized by severe skin lesion. Uh, after additional 20 generations, this, uh, they, they discover in Japan that they have the spontaneous enteritis. Uh, and it, this was uh, done at the Yakult Institute of Microbiology in Tokyo. And uh, the mouse was called then SAMP1 IT. I got these mice in 90. I was really unbelievably lucky, actually, because traditionally it's difficult to import mice from Japan. But I wrote uh, a letter <coughs> to Dr. Matsumoto uh, after I saw the premium results of this mice. I was fascinated by this spontaneous model. So I. I was at UVA at that time. Uh, it's an interesting story. So Dr. Matsumoto decided to ship me two breeding pairs of the mice. My technician took my car, drove from Charlottesville to uh, Washington, Dallas, retrieved these mice from this big Nippon everywhere thing, still alive, cold, but alive, and then brought the mice back into the vivarium, which today would be unthinkable. There was no quarantine those days. There was nothing. But at the same time, if you remember, Paul, 
Barry Marshall, who was a UVA in those days, was going around Charlotte. He tried to capture uh, opossum to infect them with H. pylori and bring him back to the vivarium because the NIH didn't give him a grant. You know, I didn't have any money. <laughs> so that's an interesting story. So after we got these mice in 1996, we bred the mice for a long time. Finally, developed the substrain. The, 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 we discovered actually the, our mice had spontaneous arthritis with perianal disease. Fascinating about this model is the fact that these mice develop fibrosis, very similar condition that you see in patients. This is an example of a stricture. This is the terminal ileum, which is restricted. There's a stricture here, but in a dilated loop. This is really what we see in patients where patients develop abdominal pain and problem. Another stricture here. They have huge mesenteric lymph nodes that drain from the gut. So this is where all the action happens in terms of lymphocyte activation. They develop perianal disease. This for me was unbelievable that a spontaneous mouse model developed this lesion that our clinician know is one of the most devastating situations in patients with Crohn's disease, perianal disease, with fistulas that goes from the periectal area into the inflamed rectum. And, and we, the incidence is around 5-10% in our colonies, but it's a very fascinating feature. This is a a CT of the area restricted I showed before. This is what you see in the patient. Histological features are very similar. Uh, you, you see 95% of the feature you see in Crohn's with thickening of the muscularis, granulomas, uh, many other feature infiltration of mononuclear cells, thickening of the muscularis. And one very nice feature of this model, different than many other models, there is a defined time course of the disease and the disease affects 100% of the mice. There are some other models, you know, IL-2 knockout mice, IL-10 knockout mice. The penetrance is only 30%, or the mice die very young. You can't study the mice. So this is a very, very uh, easy to study mouse from the point of view of, uh, of the time course. Very difficult because of the breeding. You have to breed tons of cages, tons of mice to obtain course. But basically, the uh, time course of the disease is pretty well defined. It starts around four or five weeks. Something happened at that time when the mice are win, they trigger the disease, and then you have an induction phase up to 10 weeks, and then after 10 weeks they develop chronicity. So you can really study different than what you can do in patients, for example, what happened before the induction of the disease, what happened during the induction, what happened in the chronic phase, and a lot of our publications really have shown that there are differences immunologically in terms of cytokines that are activated, so it's a very useful model from that point of view. Now, this is my new passion, the stereo microscopy, the, the paper, the, 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 the student review. And what is fascinating is when we did this a couple of years ago, for the first time, we could see the lesions in our mice that before we, we were guessing what they have in the terminal ileum. And now we see the mucosa, you see the corpuscle lesion. We can do this technique in fixed tissue like here or in fresh tissue. And what is nice, we can basically analyze in a, So you, you understand that histologically, Sometimes the data are misleading because it depends where you cut the sections in terms of, if you cut a section like this, you have no inflammation here, you have a lot of inflammation. So with this stereo microscopy technique, we can calculate the percentage of abnormal mucosa and integrate or the other, or the other data to really have a good assessment of inflammation. What we can do, I've shown this today also ground rounds, we can dissect the disease area. This is what the action is where the disease starts. We can isolate this area. We can then do whatever we want with this. We can do uh, RNA transcriptome analysis. We can do single cell uh, RNA analysis. We can do permeability study. At the same time, we can take the adjacent area that is now normal and do the same thing. So we have an internal control that is beautiful in the uninvolved area, the involved area. And this is an example of a study we published a few recently where we knocked out the, the not two gene we discovered that actually not to has a pro-inflammatory effect in these mice. You see here the comparison of the MPO activity, which is a biochemical index of inflammation, where the sample with the not to deletion have decreased inflammation both in the involved area and uninvolved area. So uh, looking at the specifics of the data I want to show you today, we decided to take the approach of deleting DR3 in our SAMP mice. Uh, this was done by, uh, this is a very tedious procedure because the mice are not on a uniform background. They are, not on, a, they are on a mixed background. So for us to introduce a, de a deletion, we have to do 10 generations of crossbreeding to obtain SAMP. They are specifically missing the DR3 gene. So we did that. 
And by, if we use a genotyping microsatellite like mark assist backcrossing, that allows sometimes to cut the 10 generation to 5 generation to obtain pure sample on the DR3 background. And uh, we also generated TNF delta re uh, deficient mice with DR3 TL1A. And the reason we did that because we want a second model to verify our data. And the TNF that are much easier because they are on the black six background, so we basically two cross, we're able to get our uh, strain. Then we assess the severity of VLI histologically, we assess cytokine measurement, and so on, and we also assess other parameters. And what we notice immediately during a time course of inflammation in, uh, in, in different parameters in our colony, that this, the deletion of DR3 cause a smaller lymph nodes uh, size. Uh, in these mice, and uh, both the weight and the cellularity of the lymph nodes is decreased after 10 weeks of age in, in our mice. Also, there is diminished MPO activity in the term alien. As I said, MPO activity is a measure biochemical index of inflammation. By 20 weeks, a very significant, and by 10 weeks, decrease. And also, uh, they uh, display a very decrease chronic iliac is analyzed by histological. So this is the total inflammatory score. You can see how the wild, we call it wild type, SAMP mice have a progressive disease that up to 60 weeks progressively increase up to a very high score of 16, and how the disease is practically almost preventing the mice they are missing. The other. So that was very impressive for us because usually it's very difficult to reduce this disease less than, uh, more than 15%, 50%. You can see here the appearance of the terminal is the cecum, the terminal ileum, you can see how the typical stamp is enlarged and uh, indurated, rubbish appearance compared to a norm, more normal appearance histologically. I think you can appreciate, if, you, if you're not a pathologist or you haven't taken a pathology class yet, you can appreciate that this is very inflamed with this appearance of the villa compared to a normal Villar appearance, no inflammation, no infiltration. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to stop during the talk. We measure cytokines that are typically mediators of disease in these mice. Uh, both Th1 cytokines, interferogamma TNF, or Th2 cytokines were significantly decreased in tissue obtained for the DR3 knockout mice. And IL-17A, which is an important mediator of, uh, of chronic intestinal inflammation, was also decreased in our tissue. And uh, also, we measure cytokine secretion for activated mesenteric lymph node cells, showing similar results with suppression of Th1 cytokines, Th2 cytokines. So a very significant anti-inflammatory effect associated with decrease in the cytokine that we have privileged shown to mediate the disease in this model. Important aspect is the fact that deleting the DR3 in our mice uh, completely prevents the development of fibrosis. We cause those strictures that I showed you before in that picture. You can see here the controlled mice with the normal appearance of the intestine, no fibrosis. And this by the special staining for Alcine Blue for fibrosis, you can see how irregular, normal SEMP mouse, uh, different magnification, have hu huge fibrosis with thickening of the muscularizer, how the SEMP DR cross with the DR3 knockout has appearance that almost revert to normal. And these are 60 weeks old mice with very significant disease. Uh, we also measure some expression of fibrotic genes in, in the model, uh, including alpha uh, SMA, collagen 1, MMP3, which are genes associated with fibrosis, with significant decrease at the false decrease in the model. And finally, we wanted to prove that the lack of DR3 on specific cell type is causing the anti-inflammatory effect. So we use a model of adoptively transferring CD4 positive cells isolated from mesenteric lymph node from both wild type cell mice and SEM DR3 knockout mice. And usually when you transfer these CD4 cells into a skid recipient mouse, you are able to generate both iliitis and colitis in the recipient mice. Because they, obviously the lymphocytes are activated and predisposed to co they have a colitogenic potential. And we, we clearly show that the CD4 that were coming from the DR3 deficient mice, here measured by uh, loss of body weight, which is a feature when the mice get colitis, 
there is very significant uh, colitis and loss of body weight in the wild type CD4 cells, which is attenuated in the mice uh, deficient in the L3 compared to the basic mice not transferring any type of cells. That is also true for the total inflammatory score. You can see the score in the ileum and the score in the colon, where the lymphocyte that don't have DR3, don't express DR3, lose their ability to induce ileitis E. coli in the transfer model. Uh, also, uh, so this is basically uh, the, the same data shown in, the, in a different format, showing the histology and showing the different parameters such as the, meso the mesentery, the cellularity, the colon length, and the MPO activity. So the expression of DR3 on lymphocyte, CD4 positive cells, is essential for the induction of lymphocyte E. coli. Same thing where we measure cytokines, the, C the lymphocyte in the mice with the transfer of CD4 deficient in DR3 has decreased level of TNF alpha, decreased level of the interferon, again mirroring the uh, experiment done in the spontaneous SAMP mice. Uh, then we turn to the, t so we say, oh, is this a, a thing specific for SAMP mice or if we use a different chronic model, we obtain similar results? And basically, this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but I would like you to uh, focus on this part. Uh, this is good. These are all the different parameters that makes the uh, chronic inflammatory score. And what we notice, so the total inflammatory score in our TNF delta mice with a DR3 deleted are significantly less at 10 weeks, at 20 weeks. These are the different components that uh, comprise the total inflammatory. The total inflammatory score is the sum of venous distortion, mononuclear inflammation, active inflammation, chronic inflammation, transmural inflammation. So basically, very similar result we saw in the other model. And uh, represented here is the histology, again, decreased inflammation by histology. MPO activity, similarly decreased, similar to what we saw in the SAMP mice. And the production of cytokines, also TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, IL-13, IL-17, significantly decreased. So this is not something specific to, a, to, a, to one mouse model, but a second mouse model really provide very similar data, suggesting that the effect of DR3 is uh, very profound. Uh, we also were interested, so we, we said, what happened if we now we cross the ligand and not the, the receptor? Theoretically, you should have the same results. Uh, you, you delete the ligand, you delete the receptor, you get the same result. Uh, interesting to our surprise, in the TNF delta V mice, we saw an early effect, so there was some anti-inflammatory effect early on, but when we got to the chronic phase of the disease, we lost the effect. And this is very interesting and suggested to us that one possibility is that other ligands that are not being identified could take over in the chronic phase and still stimulate the receptor. And this is true, in a, the TNF model is uh, simpler than SAMP in terms of, because it's only mediated by TNF. This is one possible explanation. The other explanation could be uh, talking to expert in this field, auto activation of the signal of the receptor, which to me is a little bit uh, unusual, but so I will explain more with the different ligands. You can see histologically, eight weeks, there is significant reduction, but at 20 weeks, there is very, so actually this is, sorry, this should be 20 weeks, not 10 weeks, there is full broad information at this stage. Then we look at the SAMP mouse, it's the same true for the SAMP mouse. In the SAMP mouse, we saw something even more interesting. There was no anti-inflammatory effect, either at 10 weeks, or 20 weeks. And this, in my opinion, could be explained by the fact that the TNF delta E mouse is mediated only by overexpression of TNF. It very likely is a more simple pathway of cytokine activation, where this model is much more complicated, many more. So our explanation, again, is that there is some other form of activating DR3 that just by deleting the ligand is not work. So obviously, we are trying to fish for, there are two other additional ligands that have been described in the literature that we're going to investigate in the future. And we're going to try, this is not easy, but we're going to try to fish out what the ligand could be through different techniques in, in the future. Uh, now, we, we also said, okay, what happened now if we, because, you know, knockout mice usually uh, sometimes are criticized because, you know, uh, when you knock out a gene, 
early on, there are different compensatory mechanisms. So we wanted to verify our hypothesis by blocking tier 1A using a specific mo mono, uh, mouse monoclonal antibody against tier 1A. A very interesting, I think this is, doesn't happen very often. We really saw results that really mirror our genetic study. So basically in this experiment, we took TNF delta V mice, some mice, and we treated them with a monoclonal antibody specifically for, for tier, Muriam tier 1A or an isotype control. And in this particular experiment, you also we use a positive control with dexamethasone that works very well in our sent mice. You can see that we saw early on, 12 weeks in the genetic was eight weeks, some positive effect of blocking tier 1A, but no effect in the chronic phase. And in our sent mice, uh, we saw no effect whatsoever of blocking with the, the anti-tier 1A antibody, both early and late in, in 20 weeks. In the, this is really mirroring what we saw with the genetic study. You can see here how the dexamethasone really dumped the disease before a score of five for all the mice investigated. And I think you know, this is impressive data because it's not easy to make a correlation between genetic knockouts and antibody blockade usually. So this is really a very good confirmatory study. Another thing we, we did, we did a nanostring uh, analysis. So nanostring is this technique. Basically, there's some very nice kit now that you can study a, a different set of genes using this uh, nanostring technology, which is very nice. And what you get, so usually you isolate your RNA from some tissue, you, you send it out uh, to, to this company that will run the test for you for a certain cause, and then they send you the bioinformatic analyzed data. And what you get back, is usually this uh, waterfall uh, type of graph here. Shown here is uh, the SAMP wild type mouse, the SAMP cross with the TL1A where there is no anti-inflammatory effect, and the SAMP DLT knockout where there is the uh, inflammatory effect. It, what you see here, this is basically the AKR control gene expression of, of 248 inflammatory genes, and the points are the genes that are overexpressed or underexpressed compared to the, to the control mice. You can see that the, the same tier 1A where there was no inflammatory effect, basically as a profile is very similar to control, but the SAMP mice crossed with the DRT where there was the profound anti-inflammatory effect, there is basically normalization of the gene expression uh, and, and the profile tend to get much closer, much closer to your control AKR mice. And uh, this is more uh, summarized in, in, uh, in uh, level of gene expression. These are the uh, housekeeping gene that works really well in our case. And basically from here, from there, basically uh, the, we, we were able to show that there are at least uh, two genes that are interesting underexpressed in the, in the SAMP uh, wild type mice. One is CCL21A, that a previous paper by our collaborator Klaus Ley the school collaborator in our program project has shown that it's a very important mediator of the sampiliitis by regulating the migration of dendritic cells and defensive alpha uh, RF1. And this is very fascinating because one of the major features of human chronic disease that's been described, postulated as a causative factor, is a deficiency in defensive alpha, specifically in the terminal area. So that's another evidence that there is some very close resemblance to the human condition. And then there's a variety of genes that are overexpressed. There are 73 genes that are overexpressed here, and that are normalized in this situation. And these are genes that we're going to study in the future. I don't have now the pie chart about the gene, but there are specific pathways. There are some lipooxygenase genes that are downregulated by DR3. There are definitely a lot of, of uh, cyto uh, chemokines, and uh, also some TH2 cytokines, such as IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, IL-1 cytokines. That's something that hopefully I'm going to be able to study in my next five-year grant uh, if I get my renewal fund. Another aspect that of DR3 that we were interested in studying, actually we have now a paper in press in Frontiers in Immunology, is how tier one dr 3 uh, signal regulates the, the lymphocyte, uh, in particular T-reg lymphocyte. And this was stimulated by this data that were published in the literature before by other investigators showing that the tier one a regulates the number of FOXP3 cells. So what this Dr. Porter in Florida developed an agonistic antibody against the L3, so an antibody that stimulates the signal of the L3 instead of suppressing the signal. 
and was able to show that these increased significantly the number of CD4 FOXP3 cells, that after you administer these uh, fusion protein, they also stimulate the signal of DR3, you get much increase in, in FOXP3 cells. And also, if you uh, stimulate the recombinant TL1A, the receptor, you get increase in, in TREC. So we were, we were interested in using that monoclonal antibody to increase the number of TREGs. And actually, our initial hypothesis was, OK, if we take our SEM mice, we give an agonistic DL3 antibody. If we increase the number of TREX, we're going to have an anti-inflammatory effect, right, which investigators have shown in some other pulmonary model. And as always happened in, in medicine, we saw the, in science, we saw the opposite results. When we gave the antibody, which is called 4C12, in our five-week-old mice, compared to the isotype control, we saw a marked increase in the severity of inflammation. Uh, so suggesting that we were able to stimulate FOXP3 cells, but probably very likely not regulatory cells. In, in, in we proved that we stimulated FOXP3 cells, shown here. You can see here the stimulation with the, with the 4C2 antibody significantly increased the percentage of CD4 FOXP3 positive cells, and also the FOXP3 relative expression here. But interesting, in normal control mice, we didn't see that effect. And then we, when we analyzed the subtype of cells was very interesting that we were able to, to decrease the number of CD25 positive FOXP3 cells, so these are supposed to be the regulatory population, but increase the number of CD25 negative FOXP3 cells, which probably function as an effector cell population. Uh, the, the, uh, by comparison, in the DL3 knockout mice, we saw the opposite effect. So these represent DL3 knockout some mice, in the same uh, mice with the with knockout mice, where we saw the opposite effect. We decreased the regulatory cells uh, and we increased the, these other cell population. So, the, uh, the uh, basically, this is the uh, actually, excuse me, I, I made a mistake. This is the, the same data showing, I got confused, sorry. This is the, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and this is. Um, lamina proper monocular cells. So this is the same cell population showing basically the same data. Decrease in FOXP3 C25 positive cells, regulatory cells, increase in C25 negative cells. Now these negative C25 negative cells has been described in other conditions. We don't know too much about their function, but in lupus, for example, there is evidence that these cells function as effector pro-inflammatory cells. Now when we study the DR3 deleted cell, we saw the opposite uh, trend increase in regulatory cells. Remember, these, these guys have less inflammation. A decrease effect of cells, uh, less inflammation. So we, we obviously don't have, at this point, a mechanistic explanation. This is something we're investigating. But our hypothesis is either the deadministration, the estimation of DR3, switch the, the, the regulatory cell population to an effector population that is still FOXP3, or other mechanisms could be involved through the special DR3 in this regard. But this is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Because in other models, for example, in, a, in an acute model where there is no chronic inflammation, if you do the same thing, you get an anti-inflammatory effect with this antibody, as I mentioned before. We were also interested in, in because DR3 has been, dr 2 a has been involved in the regulation of innate lymphoid cells. We also find out that the administration of the antibody increased ILC1 cells and decreased ILC3 cells. This is all done in the mesenteric lymph node because you can't get enough cells from the lamina proper monocular cell. This is interesting because the role of ILC, uh, innate lymphoid cells in IBD is still controversial. For example, ILC3 in some, some investigators propose they are pro-inflammatory. Other investigators uh, suggest they are protective. This would confirm that could be protective. You decrease the cell population, you have a pro-inflammatory effect. And the opposite is true for ILC1. So in conclusion, uh, uh, our results suggest a differential role of TL1A and DR3 in early stage stage of Crohn's disease like Iliadic. This is an important finding because all the pharmaceutical companies now, Pfizer, Amgen, they're all working on monoclonal antibody against TL1A. To, there's also a trial going on using them. And in our opinion, TL1A is not a good target for the data that I've shown you, and DR3 should be the target. So this is. Uh, it, pretty informative in terms of how to develop a, a drug against this pathway. DR3 has a pro-inflammatory role in both early and late phase of Crohn's disease. 
the tier 1a display different roles at early and later stage of disease, as I suggested. And our results suggest the possible existence of a novel tier 3 ligand that we're going to try to investigate in the uh, next year. Conclusion number two, we believe the dr 3 signal is a major regulator, a master cytokine, and a master regulator effector and regulatory mechanism in CD like the eyes, both uh, uh, at the level of molecular signaling and cellular signaling. As, as I show you, there's a regulation of molecular signaling pathways, and there is a regulation of lymphocytes in the lymphoid cell. And we believe the block in DR3 may represent a novel therapeutic modality for patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, with the caveat, the, the only caveat here, because, because of the broad effect, we have to see what this, the possible side effects of blocking the receptor could be. In fact, I think, you know, normal, so if you take black 6 dr 3 knock on mice, they are essentially normals, but they have some immunological abnormality. I believe they have some, also some brain behavioral abnormality. So it could be not a good approach. That's why through the nanostring analysis, we're trying to identify downstream pathways that, that are regulated by this pathway that can be more specifically it contains less side effects. I'd like to uh, uh, thank the people who have done uh, all this work. So Lee Wuojia is a, a research faculty who worked with me for many years, now retired. Uh, I think he's, he's uh, spending a lot of time in Charlottesville, uh, where we were before, uh, hiking, and in China, taking care of his parents. Fabulous molecular biology guy. Ludovica Buto is a, a, a postdoctoral fellow from uh, Verona. Italy, who has done most of the lymphocyte work. Teresa Pizarro, who incidentally is also my wife, and uh, <laughs> does a lot of work and uh, gets all the credit for, the, for all our research, <laughs> rightly so. Wig Zing, who is a, a pathologist who does all the analysis of our mice. Jorgo Barmias is the best postdoc I ever had in my life. We are now back in Greece, dealing with the, with the, with the economy there but finally became an associate professor in Greece. Can you imagine, he's an associate professor of gastroenterology. Eddie Wang and Linda Berkeley. Eddie Wang gave us the, the DL3 knockout mice, and Linda Berkeley gave us the, the, the DL1A knockout mice. I shut down on it. And then I want to mention two things, and now, uh, fortunately, Griffin Rogers is not here to listen, but we always have to credit the funding. I've been very... Um, uh, blessed to have NIH funding, continuous NIH funding for the last 26 years, and especially our P30 center grant, our P01 uh, program project, my two other ones. And also, I want to mention that I am now the editor in chief of the IBD journal, which is the official journal of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And we are, we are revamping the journal, Brad Lashner, the community, and myself. And we invite everybody to submit journals, even medical students. You can submit a case report, letter to the editors, original paper, review articles. And we welcome everybody to submit to the journal related to IBD. Thank you very much. And I think I finish on time, I hope. <laughs> time for a few questions, right? Yeah, great. Good. Good. Take some questions. The go. medical students need to ask questions. <laughs> Come on. Yes. So you showed quite nicely with the DR3 knockouts that uh, you had a decrease in pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine expression, TH1, TH2 cytokines. Did you look at any anti-inflammatory cytokine expression? Yeah, there, there, there was an increase in IL-10, I haven't shown you. And also, we, we, there is an increase in Tregs also during the time course. So it's mirrored by increasing IL-10 and increase actually in percentage of Tregs. So is the actual differentiation of the TH1, TH2, TH17 cell affected, or do you think it's just an increase in Tregs that maybe is... Yeah, we haven't, we haven't looked at that specifically. That, that's a very nice, very important question that we need to look at. We haven't looked specifically. We just, uh, that time, uh, this time we have association and not really look into the mechanism of all these uh, different uh, phenomena. Yeah. Yes? Um, so in your normal mice, do you see any, like, cancers? Um... Yeah. So the, you talk about the SAMP mice, right? So, so both SAMP mice and TNF delta mice are interesting. They only develop terminal ileitis and inflammation in the terminal ileum. The colon is not affected. In, in a normal situation, there is no colitis. So we believe that in, in one way, there are some mechanisms of regulation that keep the colon healthy. Now, you know that two-thirds of patients with Crohn's only have disease in the small intestine. 
we don't really know why some people get colitis, some people get terminal colitis. So spontaneously, we don't see any inflammation. What we have done in our sample mice, we recently published a paper on that, we challenge our mice with DSS, low-dose DSS, uh, three different cycles to induce colitis. And what we saw that they gave a more severe chronic colitis compared to control mice, and at the end of the three cycles, they developed polyps and, and cancer which we don't see in the control mice. So they, are, they have a colon that is definitely predisposed to inflammation, predisposed to cancer, but you have to challenge the mice to see that phenotype. What about perianal disease? The perianal disease is low incidence. It's around 5 to 10% of the mice. So what we have done now, because we have a lot of requests for therapeutic study for perianal disease, we have created a model in collaboration with the colorectal surgeon where we induce perianal the perianal fistula by putting a ring in that area. And then when we relieve the ring after a week, the fistula lasts much longer in the sub mice, so there is defect in healing. So we're using that model to, to, to treat therapeutic study. But the incidence is relatively low to do any therapeutic study or treatment study using the model. Yes? Yes. Yes. Do you have any updates on, on that? Yes, I have some updates. So the update is that Alex Rodriguez, is my junior faculty works on this project, uh, has uh, discovered some bacteria that are associated with this disease. So for people who have read the paper, so we discovered that specimen from a Crohn's patient, when examined by stereo microscopy, uh, by MRI of the wall, there are some lesions inside the wall that are not visible by, by visual inspection, but there are different type of fist, internal little fistula, microfistula, cavernous lesion, some liquefaction of the tissue. And what Alex has done is isolated bacteria that are specifically associated with that tissue. What we believe is that this bacterial association caused the lesion in the progression of the disease, obviously on a background of a predisposed individual. So what we have done, we have isolated with this bacteria, we are culturing this bacteria, we know what they are now, and now we are testing their pro or anti-inflammatory activity using transplantation into SAMP that are gem-free. So we take our gem-free mice, we associated them, or we transplanted them with one or multiple bacteria, and then we studied them in terms of their ability to develop reality. Because remember, gem-free SAMP mice still develop disease in the absence of a gut microbiota. Attenuated disease, much longer time, but they still develop disease. So that's the update. And we hope that, I, mean, I think this is really Alex's idea, uh, and uh, I think it's a very innovative approach because I was telling the medical student, if I can take one second, that we think this is very important. First of all, because when you resect a, a Crohn special, let's say you do a ileocecal resection, or you, do, you do an anastomosis, a one year after the operation, 60% of patients, they have endoscopic recurrence and disease in the pre area. We believe that maybe, when there is a recession, when the pathologist, uh, the surgeon says, okay, his uh, area is, uh, the margin are free, et cetera, but you don't know if there are these internal lesions in this area, that could go. That's one point. Second point clinically is antibiotics don't work in Crohn's disease, and one reason could be if you have this lesion with necrotic tissue where bacteria are encapsulated into this lesion, the antibiotic, so it's well known, I told the medical student, chronic prostatitis is a huge problem, right? Because why? Because the inflammation inside the prostate in this dense tissue, the antibiotic don't reach the, 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 the inside of the, the prostate. So by having knowledge of this lesion, for example, in, in, the, in the ideal world, we would like to identify the lesion, work with polyaton to develop an endoscope where we can go into discover a lesion, biopsy that by endoscopic ultrasound, and, and inject antibiotics specifically in the lesion. So a lot of futuristic nice things. Uh, like, like I'm a dreamer too, yes. Yes. So, so what we are doing right now in humans, we just take the larger possible specimen and we study what's going on. In terms of doing something, as I said, more proactive in terms of diagnostic or therapeutic, et cetera, we need to develop something 
different that we need to do in vivo. So theoretically, I can envision how you can have endoscope connected to an MRI. I don't know how it's possible. Some kind of imaging probe that allow you to see that, and then you know, a, a stereo microscope that go through a scope, and you're able to amplify the image and see that in vivo if you want to do something. Right now, we only work on necroscopy specimen to isolate the bacteria, to see the lesion, to characterize. And the other, the other interesting thing, the other interesting thing is that we think, and we applied for a big grant that unfortunately we didn't get in this through a foundation. But the idea is that by characterizing this lesion, I think we can understand this heterogeneity of the Crohn's patient. You know, so why patients are so different? Maybe you know, you say, oh, this is Crohn's, but let's look at the lesion. So are all the patients have cavernous lesion, necroscopic lesion? internal fissure. That would be very nice in terms of classifying what type of patient you're dealing with. Yes? Uh, so you had one slide uh, earlier where you're uh, measuring inflammation with a TL1A antibody and then using dexamethasone as a positive agent. Yes. Why did you see an increase in inflammation? I forgot what the time period was, but why did you see an increase in inflammation even while on methasone initially and later on as well? I, I don't understand the increase in inflammation. Uh, it, uh, you had the dexamethasone. Dexamethasone decrease inflammation. The anti one a does not affect. There's not an increase in inflammation. Uh, and, the, and then the after, I think it was 20 weeks or something, um, you had increased inflammation again, even when being treated with dexamethasone. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I, I can review. I, I'll, I'll, I'll review data, but I don't think so. The, 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 data, the, the dexamethasone is only one time point. We do it one week before sacrificing the, the animals, right? So the dexamethasone is always decreased. I don't think it was isotype against. So I don't think it was dexamethasone. I can, I, when we're done, we can review the slide. Yeah. yeah. So yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So at the beginning of, of your talk, you, you talked about the, the heterogeneity of IBD and how the genetics of these diseases are, are so complicated we might never really fully understand them. And then later on, you mentioned that uh, pharmaceutical companies are working on monoclonal antibodies to, to work with these uh, diseases. Um, so in the long term, Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So one issue is the cure, right? So one issue we would like one day to find the helicobacter or the colon that cures everybody, right? So one issue to understand, and I don't think it's a disease where you're going to find only one cause. I think this is more a syndrome. You have patients that are more genetics. There, so for example, early, very early onset IBD. I just saw a girl that developed Crohn's disease at two years old. Is very developmental mental retardation, and she has a specific mutation in one gene, and she has Crohn's disease in terms of. You know, so there are some diseases more genetic. I'm sure there's some diseases more autoimmune. There's some disease. So I think w what we are trying to do to identify a subgroup of patients where that we can bunch together and develop. So in my lifetime, if I'm going to be able to find a cure for 20% of patients with IBD, I'm going to be very happy. But I, unlikely are gonna find the cure for 100% of the patient. So that's one approach, find the cause and find the cure. The, the therapeutic approach until now has been to treat the inflammatory symptoms to induce mucosal healing. And what I say, put patient in permanent remission. That's not a cure, but if it allows like some of my patients to live a normal life, feel good about themselves and, and have a normal life, that's already a big accomplishment. So on one hand, and, you know, I don't know how much pharmaceutical companies want to find a cure. I mean, they want to find a drug that you can give every day and, and you make a lot of money. Unfortunately, that's the reality of the business that they are in. But, you know, I said there are two different issues to find an anti inflammatory treatment that allows someone to be, you know, in, in remission all the time or find the cure, which is a different issue. I more in, I'm more interested to find the cure, but I'm also interested in making people feel better, you know, until I'm working on this disease. Okay? Yes. Um, both uh, in the various underlying causes and how it presents, but we do kind of divide it up into Crohn's disease and colitis, for instance. And there's some, like the paradoxical effect of nicotine, for instance, um, in one versus the other. Do you think that your mouse model, um, some of the molecular mechanisms that you're, you're under, thing, do you think that they describe one disease or the other better? Yeah, I mean, it, they just, it, it does describe better Crohn's disease because, you know, Crohn's, uh, ulcer colitis only affect the colon, so this mice have. But 
That's why we say CD-like ileitis, because it's very difficult to compare a model exactly to a type of disease. But also remember that there is a lot of overlap between the disease. So for example, there are some patients that in remission look, look like Crohn's disease. They have you know, Crohn colitis. But then when they have the flare, they look at ulcerative colitis. It's, there are some patients we call it indeterminate colitis because we can't make a diagnosis. So there's a lot of overlap. Look at the genetic uh, association overlaps between the two diseases. So I think you know our model represents a subgroup of you know patients with Crohn's disease that are they don't have a mutation in R2. They only have terminal terminal disease. They respond to NDTNF. They respond to steroids. You know so the mouse model is representative. Of course, not of the entire population, but. The subgroup was something that I say is more similar to Crohn's that, that you see because of the location of disease, the histological lesion, the transmural information, and all the other features. Well, no problem. Okay, if there are uh, no more questions, please join me in thanking Dr. Donnell.